Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Franklin. I'm the executive director of Boulder Giving. I'm delighted to have you all join us for our Diaspora Philanthropy Bold Conversation. Um, we're really excited to be co-sponsoring this with WINGS and to have so many of you joining us from all around the world. Um, before I introduce the rest of our team here on the various video screens, just a couple things about uh, logistics and about our co-sponsors. So Boulder Giving, the organization I run, we're based in New York City and work to inspire people to give both across the United States and internationally. Um, we have in particular a Global Givers Initiative, which we launched last year with uh, support from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, beginning in Central and Eastern Europe, in Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, and Turkey, which has been growing over the last year to include other countries in Central and Eastern Europe and now expanding beyond to other regions of the world. And with that work, um, unlike our work in, New in the United States, where we often work directly with donors, helping them think about their own giving, on an international front, our hope is to work with the civil society groups and NGOs that are trying to promote a culture of giving in their own philanthropy. So we're excited to do this as the first in an ongoing series of webinars as one piece of our work to help promote individual philanthropy in the entire globe. Uh, we're also ex excited to partner with WINGS, the Worldwide Initiatives for Grantmaker Support for this webinar series. Um, WINGS is a network of 90 grantmaker associations and philanthropic support organizations in more than 30 countries around the globe. And together, they represent over 22,000 philanthropic entities from all regions of the world. Uh, their mission is to strengthen, promote, and provide leadership on the development of philanthropy around the world. And having been to several of the WINGS conferences, I can tell you they're a really great resource when you look at international philanthropy and the questions and variations and changes and dynamics that we are facing and looking at as we try to promote individual giving and corporate philanthropy and uh, institutional philanthropy in different parts of the world. So joining us today for this call, um, besides all of you, and thank you for joining us, um, my colleague Otar, who's sitting here with me in New York, is our program manager and leading our Global Stories initiative. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and then also in New York, um, Bersham Mirza, who is a, a Turkish diaspora a philanthropist herself and also on the board of the Turkish Philanthropy Funds. And from South Africa, Jenny Hodgkins, who, Hodgkin, who is the executive director of the Global Fund for Community Foundations. So thank you, Berju and Jenny, so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, in terms of the next hour we'll all have together, we're going to uh, dive in, inviting um, Jenny and Berju to share a little bit of their own uh, background and story and some of their observations about diaspora giving to get us started. And then we, of course, have I have plenty of questions I could ask them for the next hour, but would love to hear from all of you as well the questions you have for Jenny, for Berju, for Otar and myself, or for all of us as a group. Um, to send in your questions, simply type them into the Q&A box that is below the video monitors. You can type them in now and throughout the next hour, and we will get to and engage as many of the, your questions as we can uh, in this conversation. But to start us off, uh, Jenny, maybe you want to start us off first and tell us a little bit about how did you end up at the Global Fund for Community Foundations, and what do you do today? <laughs> sure. Thank you, Jason. Um, well, I have... Over the last, uh, well, since about 1997, uh, been working in the space of emerging markets and developing uh, countries' philanthropy. Um, it sort of started off by accident, really, as all these things do. I found myself in Russia in the mid. 1990s, just at the time when um, the new laws for the NGO sector were coming into place, and uh, new laws around uh, building a Russian philanthropic sector. And so in those early years when community foundations were first uh, introduced in, in Russia, really as a mechanism for creating 
new ways for different people within the same community to start to engage, uh, begin to develop relationships with each other, overcome some uh, nascent distrust that which exists between different cultures. Um, and since then, I've worked um, in East Africa. I was based in Kenya for four years, working uh, for the Ford Foundation. Jenny, you're, Can you not hear uh, me? Video and audio is pausing. No, we're actually getting a, an overlay of your audio is like three words at the same Can time. Turn off. Why don't camera. we try turning off your camera for a moment and seeing if it clears up the audio signal? Sorry, everyone, we were having some challenges. Take with Jenny said uh, South African infrastructure. So we. I'm going to switch off my webcam. Great. Is that better? Okay, let's see how it goes. Is that, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah? Yes, now you sound more... Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, yeah. Sorry, the uh, internet isn't, isn't super here, which is an important thing when you're starting to talk about giving and working internationally. Is the infrastructure is not the same in all parts of the world. Um, so I've been with, uh, as I was saying, I was based in Russia and then subsequently in East Africa based in Kenya looking at the sort of emergent philanthropic sector um, and then based in Singapore and Thailand working on some of the large efforts um, funded particularly by um, the Ford Foundation to develop uh, local foundations really as a cornerstone of a healthy civil society. Um, so the Global Fund for Community Foundations was set up uh, at the end of 2006 and really it was set up as an experiment to see whether there was a uh, really um, an interest and um, market for the idea of something called community foundations or community philanthropy in, in a global way, the, whether there was an opportunity for um, a global organization that could take a bird's eye view of what were often nascent or emerging local philanthropic sectors. So um, since uh, 2006, when the first grants were awarded, we've made around we've made grants to around uh, approaching 160 organisations in 54 countries, um, and our work is really small grants and a lot of technical support and network building to try and start to connect these often disparate and unconnected dots to each other. Um, so that we have the beginnings of what one might call a global community philanthropy sector. Um, so the types of organizations that we are looking at and why this sort of connects with today's um, topic for discussion around diaspora philanthropy is that we see our work very much in the context of new philanthropic sectors, private foundations, um, uh, foundations set up by families, etc. But what we are really looking at is the, the uh, emergence of multi-stakeholder, multi-donor, multi-owner philanthropic institutions, if you like. So a lot of the organizations that we work with, which are community foundations, environmental funds, women's funds, some public foundations, are doing a number of things. One of them is that they are all talking about building a culture of philanthropy and a culture of giving. And the idea that no amount, no gift is too small and that everyone can be a donor. And I think the experiences in many of the developing countries in the world is if you ask people if they are a donor, they would say no. But if you ask them if they supported their family's school fees or a neighbor's hospital bills or funeral things, that they would all say yes. So we're looking at institutions that see donors in the sort of widest sense from very individual, local, small gifts to kind of larger um, bilateral um, development agencies, international foundations, private foundations, and really that they're creating uh, an, one sort of inclusive umbrella organization where that can mobilize these multiple um, forms of resources. And by doing so, kind of oil the machinery of, of creating trust between different players in, in the sector. Um, 
I think, uh, you know, a lot of the community foundations that we work with emerged from some very practical reasons is that there was less international development money or no international development money around, a sense that corporations maybe had to give but they didn't know how to give, a sense that governments were doing less and so they needed some money from other sectors. So setting up systems, organized ways for people to, to give and, and receive. But also, I think it's partly in the context of a critique of a lot of international development aid, a sense that a lot of development aid has been short-term and top-down, and that really a lot of the language around building relationships with your donors um, working, thinking long term, but the community philanthropy space has been one to start thinking about a different kind of donor beneficiary um, relationship. And finally, I would say um, the idea that when an organization has multiple stakeholders, it itself becomes a place to discuss that community's issues. So where, the, where those stakeholders are, it doesn't really matter. So it could be people from outside or locally or who've moved there. But the idea that you're actually actively offer offering a platform for people to come together to talk about the place in which they live or they have a connection with and how collectively that they can start to perhaps pool small contributions or large contributions for the good of their own community. So I'll stop there. Thank you. And actually, Jenny, I wanted to ask you a quick follow-up before we move to Berger and ask her to share some reflections. I'm wondering, have you seen in the work that you've been doing with the Global Community Foundations, how do you bridge that gap you were talking just at the end of engaging people in community, in conversation, as well as in giving, the mix of people who are living locally in that community and the diasporas who have a connection back to it? Have you seen anything that's worked particularly well or how that has played out in different places? Um, it's an interesting one. I think, um, you know, there are reasons, often reasons why diaspora are diaspora, why they left, why they're not there, and the different kinds of relationship that they have there with their home place. I think a lot of the organizations that we are working with are starting with their local communities but are being quite strategic about starting to think about diaspora communities. I think there are some countries where diaspora means politics and other countries where diaspora has meant sort of uh, been a product of economic migration. So I think where it's easier, um, some efforts to do that. But as I'm sure we'll come on to discuss, this is really hard work and about balancing those interests between external and internal stakeholders, I think, is quite important. There's one, one initiative that we've been involved with in Haiti, which is looking to create a, a Haiti Community Foundation. And obviously, the Haitian diaspora is massive, but looking forward, the getting the balance between investing in infrastructure and capacity on the ground in Haiti and getting buy-in from Haitians who are still in Haiti obviously remains the kind of focal point, and then the extent to which one can leverage uh, diaspora funding for this sort of shared vision um, is part of it. But I think that, so I think it's an, a huge, an area with huge potential, but it's really sort of still quite emergent in many ways. Thank you. Um, well, Berger, I know you've had direct experience in grappling with exactly that, both in your own life as a Turk living in the U.S. and being engaged, giving back to Turkey, and now with the Turkish Philanthropic Fund and the work you've been doing to organize other members of the Turkish community. Um, can you share a little bit about your own journey and into philanthropy and into the Turkish Philanthropy Fund and what you've seen? Thank you, Jason, and Otar, and Anna. It's, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Boulder Giving and Wings for um, hosting this webinar because um, this is a very important topic and I think it's come even more of a prominence in the last, uh, last couple of years. It's, um, well, as um, most likely uh, most people have seen my profile, but just to give a brief background, I grew up in Turkey and I um, came to Mount Holyoke College as an 18-year-old. Um, and uh, since leaving my job on Wall Street, um, I've been focused a lot more in um, uh, carrying out uh, philanthropy but in a um, methodical and systematic way. Um, now, this is already done in the, in the U.S., but I would say if you're trying to help, um, even if it's your own country, 
um, if you're trying to help um, an, an area or a society that you're not, you know, living, um, uh, it's not your backyard, then you have to be um, even more careful. And, uh, and, and you also need the strength of institutions um, to help you carry your work and make sure that it's meaningful and impactful. Um, therefore, I've been um, serving on the um, leadership council of MIT's Public Service Center for the last six years and uh, on the uh, board and executive committee of Turkish philanthropy funds for the last two years. And I would say that those institutions and the resources that they have has certainly shaped um, how I have been thinking about um, what I can do to make a difference. Um, I will uh, just to give a quick background um, on uh, Turkish philanthropy funds, um, which I'll call TPF. Um, this is the um, the leading American uh, foundation that is focused on Turkey, and I would call that Turkey's Community Fund. Um, we have, even though it's been started just eight years ago, um, it has already granted 13 million uh, U.S. dollars to um, social innovation um, and investment projects in Turkey, and uh, we are um, we have over 90 uh, projects that are taking place in 59 uh, cities. So it's not just the big town, the city is also the um, small uh, towns that we are in. And um, when we um, do our work, um, as Anna has said, uh, community foundation is really where all those stakeholders come together. So we work with the local um, uh, NGOs there. Um, and uh, we, um, we not only uh, here educate and uh, help our donors to realize their philanthropic dreams, but also in Turkey um, uh, have these deep connections with the local NGOs so that they can do and carry out their work in the best way. Um, but, but all of this, this, this two platform, um, uh, two level platform really comes together um, in an umbrella of uh, sharing knowledge, sharing awareness, and um, and working as a team um, uh, all together. Um, I just have a quick follow up on that. So you're saying that the best way for diasporas um, who don't live in their home countries to give back is through to find the right intermediary. I would call that an institution, um, uh, not just an intermediary, because you could actually, um, um, you can actually give back now using just global giving, or you can uh, try to do uh, microcredit. But um, what has, um, I mean, 10 years ago, frankly, I was at that level. I thought it's really important to just give to the projects today. Um, and uh, and uh, let's just uh, meet um, the people's unmet needs. But, um, but having really gone through a couple of projects myself and having seen it, now I cannot stress the importance of having an institutional approach um, to this. Um, because at the end of the day, philanthropy is down people to people, and we're really helping people and giving, making an impact on their lives. And, and you want that impact to be a positive impact, but you also want that impact to be meaningful in the, in the big sphere of things. Um, by um, by just tweaking one aspect of um, of someone's life in Turkey, um, if you just leave it there, then that does not really carry on. That will not have the leverage. But if you can think of it in the in the big picture, and, and if you can um, uh, continue on the long term and make it uh, the efforts um, impactful and make the whole project sustainable. Um, then that is when you really um, make uh, systematic positive change um, and, and you're being a catalyst. Um, so you're creating an example which the others can follow um, on, on, you know, at the footsteps of your own work. Um, so in that sense, uh, when I, and my idea of an intermediary is really an institution with um, quite a large reach with many stakeholders with professional management and and with um, a really systematic, thoughtful, and methodical um, uh, way of approaching things. Thank you, Thank you so much. I mean, uh, it's funny. I was actually talking to someone over the weekend about this webinar and uh, mentioned that I was doing a program. We've been working with Mackenzie River Gathering Foundation, which is a community foundation in Oregon. And she said, well, Jason, you're kind of like part of the Oregon diaspora. You know, you live on the other coast. And 
think it's the same, in some ways, the same experience that I do. I love the work of MRG, and I grew up in Oregon, living in New York. I'm far from the work on the ground there. And so being able to trust an institution locally on the ground in Oregon to support things back in the community I grew up in is a really valuable experience. Um, and yet, I was pushing back to my friends saying, yeah, but it is also really different, still within the United States, still within the same tax system, still within the same nonprofit governance system, still within the same political and economic system more broadly. Um, and I'm curious, you know, Jenny, um, maybe we'll go you first, but Virgil, you have thoughts on this too. You know, what have you seen as the biggest barriers? I mean, the institutions, community foundations, uh, diaspora, NGOs can be a, a bridge, but what gets in the way of people giving? Is it is it simply distance? Is it information? Is it the legal systems, you know, political heritage of why you left or why your family left the country in the first place? What do you think are the key barriers that inhibit the amount of diaspora giving that we see? Um, it's an, an excellent question, and I think. Um, you know, obviously there are sort of logistics involved in global giving, which can sometimes be costly, and um, that can sort of add up to the, uh, you know, it, it's not always a straightforward kind of transaction. So, um, you know, as we're as a global grant maker, we know how hard it can be sometimes just to make a payment to a bank in Russia, for example. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are just hard. You need to translate things. But I think, um, you know, given, that, as, as Bursha was saying, the, this, uh, this the understanding the role of valid intermediaries and intermediaries that add value, that these are actually organizations that are close to the ground, have eyes and ears in the community, know the community, know how to target resources, hugely powerful. And I would say that... Um, one of the sort of interesting, I mean, the community foundation field is growing very rapidly, I think, at the moment, as is the discourse associated with community philanthropy. And I know that a lot of American community foundations manage the global giving of their donors. So they are donors who give through the community foundation domestically. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm being distracted by you guys switching ears. <laughs> um, so, so a donor living in the U.S. may give to their local community foundation in the U.S. and understand the value, you know, the idea of sort of donor services, of paying administrative fees, the idea that the community foundation knows the community is best placed to reach the community. And yet there's a sort of contradiction when it comes to a lot of their global giving because they will give through very, um, you know, trusted, efficient intermediaries like um, Global Giving or Global Green Grants, but actually those organizations really aren't in-country uh, intermediaries. They are intermediaries looking for more intermediaries. And in a sense, I always uh, wonder why uh, community foundations themselves haven't done more to support community foundations in emerging markets and developing contexts, that actually if you had in place um, an organization that could receive your money easily, could reach communities much further beyond you know, uh, the reach of many international donors, that could actually build social capital, that you could use small donations to go quite far into the local community, that is a hugely kind of powerful tool. And also, just in the sort of bigger picture, a kind of powerful tool for building sort of democratic culture and participation when you have a local institution in place that's owned by many people and can target resources in many ways. So I think, I think we are going to reach the point where these two pieces, these different pieces of the infrastructure will start to meet each other, that we'll see the emergence of stronger intermediaries in the global south, uh, community foundations and others. But at the moment, they're not quite there yet. And I think it often comes down, you know, one of the main um, barriers beyond the sort of just the paperwork involved, which can be very overwhelming for in-country NGOs to have to fill a hundred, you know, we've received requests in the past from U.S. community foundations, and we've struggled to fill the papers in. So the organization on the ground in Tanzania is really, you know, going to struggle, and the donation isn't really worth it. 
So it's about, um, you know, oiling that machinery to make that work better. But also, um, I think when you look at community foundations in developing contexts, many of them are really being very thoughtful about how they negotiate with power and how they put people without power at the heart of their work, so using small grants to empower communities and things like that. And sometimes that donor relationship can be quite distorting unless it's managed, um, you know, in a, in a thoughtful thoughtful way. And I was, I was very delighted to hear Burshu talk about, you know, that you're the kind of philanthropist that the world <laughs> needs because it is that how you start, it's not enough the act of giving, it's how you start to connect those acts of giving so that you can bring around real social change. And to do that, we know that um, this requires, it requires an institution and there's a cost associated with that. And so somehow moving, we, we have been educated well as donors and I use well in adverted commas um, to say, oh, administrative costs are bad, bad. You know, we want to get all our money out to the end user. But actually, when we start to think about it, the value of institutions that can profession, particularly in low trust environments, that can professionally manage money, deploy resources, identify groups, get the money to them, provide other kinds of supports, you know, really can't be uh, overestimated. So I think I think that you know it, it is to do with I think it's about modeling the behavior and really these sorts of platforms um, you know where where you've had the kind of the thoughtful experiences the donors who realize that it's not not just about the one off grant and um, are, are really really important in kind of modeling that that type of behavior. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, and just for those of you who have joined, um, we did get a question. So Jenny uh, Hodkin, who is the Executive Director of the Global Fund for Community Foundations, joining us from South Africa. Her internet connection is not as strong as we'd hoped, so she is just joining us on audio. Um, and for, since we haven't many people have joined since we started, just a reminder, please feel free to ask your questions of all of us, just type them into the Q&A box below the videos. Um, but Berger, any reactions or additions to that, to this theme or conversation? No, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Jenny for, um, for recognizing that, and, um, and, I, and I appreciate uh, her kind words. Um, maybe here, a little bit of my story could actually be uh, quite descriptive. In my case, I cannot take the credit for uh, coming to um, you know, this conclusion because I myself was uh, educated by people. Um, the, my, my first education took place at MIT's Public Service Center where um, um, you know, um, we were really stressed on how important it is um, that the projects, uh, the grants that are given, are um, are managed and um, and there is always there has been many stakeholders involved to, to make sure that everything is done in the correct accountable and innovative uh, way because you need you need many minds it takes a village to make a difference and you need many minds um, to really converge on um, on uh, a, a project to make sure that it actually is viable and it will work work especially in a foreign environment. Um, where uh, there may not be other high-level, um, high-trust-level institutions. Um, my second um, uh, teachers were the um, founders of Turkish Philanthropy Funds. Um, uh, it's uh, Haldun Tashman and Özdenan Kalav, who themselves had exactly this problem. Um, not so long ago, you actually, um, I mean, not, not even as a Turkish American, as an American, you could, you would have all the platform and institutions that enabled you to. Um, live in Turkey, work in Turkey, and and um, and invest in Turkey or earn income from Turkey, but um, but you would not necessarily have the um, right um, uh, vehicle um, platform to be able to donate to Turkey um, as an individual, as an individual donor, in an accountable, tax deductible, um, uh, tax efficient way. Um, and uh, and I must say that donors have. Um, very different um, uh, uh, mediums when they're donating. Not everybody also wants to um, give cash today. Um, you could do planned giving. Um, you could do donor advice funds. Um, you could um, uh, you could just try to donate uh, medical equipment, um, uh, just to give an idea of a few or, or even real estate. 
And, and here at TPF, these founders have made sure that all these vehicles that have been used for uh, decades in the American philanthropy could also be used for, um, for Turkish causes um, as well. Um, um, I would say that uh, when a donor wants to give this, this platform, platform to be able to give and uh, transfer financial capital in an accountable way, is the most important thing because people really do not have uh, time to deal with the paperwork or to start their own um, uh, uh, foundations or nonprofits. Uh, it, it, it is a lot of work uh, trying to do those things, even uh, for your own family fund. Um, uh, if you're not planning on giving millions, um, you really need to stand with somebody. You need to have a team and do it together with them. Uh, my second, the second, um, um, the second thing that a lot of donors say they want to give, but they did not, may not have the institutions for it, is social capital. Um, there are some wonderful people who have the time, who, who have ideas, and and who, who want to volunteer. Um, and if you do not have an institution, then it's quite hard to to take this social capital, um, to welcome these donors, to welcome the connections that they want to bring in order to enrich all the work that is done, um, not only, uh, I'm here speaking for Turkey, of course, but for, um, for uh, most other uh, developing countries. Um, so an institution is very important because that becomes a center that brings the community together and then once you actually can get the community together around an, a mission and uh, get them to um, be excited, uh, well, that is when um, the project is, is there to stay in the long term. And there are enough stakeholders who will make sure that uh, the impact is done, benchmarks are hit, and uh, the project is actually uh, giving results. The third thing I would say that um, the donors, um, some donors look for, um, but did not have, um, uh, if there is not an institution uh, to help them uh, put through, is the innovation to utilize um, philanthropy as leverage capital. I was just talking to a donor on this today, and he was very adamant that he wanted to use his, um, his uh, philanthropy um, to meet the cause of the um, issues, not necessarily take care of the issue today, but he wanted to be a catalyst for change. And he said for him, the most important thing is the institution that can deliver that. He's a global person, uh, even though he's a diaspora member, he's himself, he's himself, he sees himself as a global um, uh, uh, citizen. Uh, and he said, therefore, most of his giving have always been towards American institutions who have the capacity ability and capability uh, to uh, utilize his philanthropic uh, funds uh, for uh, leverage capital um, to create a change, to test some assumptions that we have in the society, to find better solutions um, to the long-standing problems. Um, and I would say that um, um, those, those three things are quite important for most of the donors. And um, an institution should really try and, um, and address them all. Um, now, I will say that um, at TPF, we were able to address it because we have created the, the structure where you, could, um, uh, you can send even medical equipment um, to a hospital in Turkey. And it's all done by the staff. Um, and it does not uh, take much time um, except for willingness um, on the donor's part. Um, the social capital has been a little bit tougher because um, uh, that takes time and it actually needs a um, large board, a large advisory board, and lots of people who are in the mission. Um, and, um, and we also have realized that um, young people are usually excluded from um, philanthropy because most of them really have social capital to contribute, but they may not necessarily have the funds to give today. Um, by creating a junior board and especially focusing on them using web technology, we have uh, tried to uh, make them an important and uh, um, long-standing member of the community today. Uh, we hope that um, this way we're able to build the future um, for our work 
because um, they will certainly be, uh, if they believe in it today, they will certainly um, uh, take the flag up today and carry it in the long run. Um, the innovation to utilize um, philanthropy as leverage capital um, is um, something that we are actually really focused on um, at TPF. Now, those projects take time uh, to develop, and in order to do them well, you have to have many stakeholders, but, um, but that is a very important um, uh, uh, turning point, I think, for, um, for not only us, but for many other um, uh, philanthropic institutions, because this is something that the donors uh, demand, is something that they want to see, and every donor-centric institution, in order to serve their donors, will have to uh, take up uh, this uh, third important cause to deliver their best results. Thank you, Bersha. Um, it's a quick question to Jenny. Um, the whole point of Boulder Giving's Global Givers Initiative is to help promote and establish the culture of philanthropy um, in Central and Eastern European countries, and now we're expanding globally. So my question to you as a grassroots philanthropy promotion funder is, what are um, some of the challenges that your grantees face in their home communities in trying to promote the culture of philanthropy? And do you have any advice um, for them to overcome them? Um, I think uh, the issue of um, a lack of trust um, is, is a big one, a lack of trust in civil society, a lack of trust in the NGO sector um, can be a, a huge barrier. Um, the NGO sector, particularly when it's been um, reliant on external funding, which is possibly slightly less the case in Central and Eastern Europe than other parts of the world, has also not done itself uh, great favours in terms of building relationships with local donors. Uh, it's often easier to write a grant proposal than to go and speak to a business person down the road about why your work matters. So I think there is some sort of need to align, um, you know, align this conversation between people who want to give and maybe don't, maybe are starting at the sort of charitable end of the spectrum and sometimes the NGO sector that can be quite sort of um, high and mighty about its sort of principles and, uh, you know, the kind of change it wants to bring about, that kind of fear, uh, scaring off donors. So it's about finding the sort of middle ground almost and, um, and, and then moving your donors with you. I think um, now because we're starting to see the first community foundations in Central and Eastern Europe, you know, reach their 20 years, 15 years anniversaries, these organizations have, have learned a lot. They've built up relationships with different parts of the community. I think it is different if you are a community foundation relying on local resources. It is, you have to go about dealing with sensitive issues in your community in a different way from if you had an external grant from uh, you know, a, a Western donor. But moving uh, your donors so that they begin to realize that actually you can't ignore some of these problems. So whether it's issues to do with the Roma, um, or, you know, other sort of sensitive issues that new donors might not want to engage with, they might prefer to turn their uh, eyes away from. If you can sort of show ways that small grants can make a difference um, around building a community, building communities, strengthening the capacities of local groups, I think one of the most powerful tools um, of, a, of a community foundation is that ability to make a small grant to a community group that never thought that it was going to be an organization. They were just doing some stuff, and then they got a grant, and then they implemented a project. And that whole process was transformational for them. They came together. They realized by putting together a grant application what it was they wanted to do, how they were going to do it. So that sort of all those soft skills about building the capacities uh, of individuals to come together to have a voice as a voice as an institution, I think, is, is hugely powerful. Um, and, and sometimes I think where, where we see groups that are starting with more of a kind of rights orientation, they really struggle with the local philanthropy development piece to start with. I think those groups that keep the sort of social justice issues on their horizons and find ways to lead with them, to, to get to them, um, you know, moving their donors along are in a different kind of place altogether. I remember a, a grant that we made 
in a country in the former Soviet Union some years back, and the foundation had received money from a tobacco company for, for, uh, to set up the foundation. And of course, it was a sort of rather tricky situation. But after a number of grant rounds, the director of the community foundation called me and said, we realized from all these small grants, we've met all these people that we've made grants to, that the main problem in our community is the tobacco industry, you know. Um, but that ability to kind of um, to build an agenda by the voices of people in the community. So it wasn't the community foundation announcing this. It was multiple people talking to them to that. And I think that, you know, the power of small grants, that this develop, kind of development doesn't have to be expensive. It has to be very intensive, yes, and often it's more than about money. It's about all kinds of other support is hugely powerful. And I think particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, where there have been fewer distortions um, but from external development aid, you've seen a lot of innovation of you know, using um, philanthropy, small grants as a mechanism to start talking about civic engagement, bringing people into the same place, planting trees, tidying up the city. And those that's exactly the kind of social capital that Borsa was talking about, that you're actually creating the, the sense of an organization that people trust and is trusted. And then when external donors, I mean, diaspora donors come to the fore, you know, if, if, if community foundations can have their grantees and their donors as their champions, to me, that, that is the sign of a trusted organization. Um, just one sort of less uh, uh, story, which is um, really about what it is um, that community foundations are trying to do and the kinds of resources that they target. One of our partners in Romania um, has created a, something they call a community card, with, and they've agreed with a number of shops that when people buy something, they swipe the card, and a small donation goes to the community fund. And it doesn't raise a huge, a huge amount. It's like $5,000 a month. There are 13,000 card holders or something. But if their goal is to create a community of givers, the money doesn't matter. It's the symbolic nature of that kind of participation. So for diaspora donors, you know, to, to come to an organization that has that in its institutional DNA, I think, is a very good sign that this is an organization that is trusted and valuable and really thinking about how it builds the community from the bottom up. For a diaspora donor who comes into an organization that's got, you know, 95 percent reliant on external grant funding, you might wonder really about the sort of rootedness of, of it in the, in the, in the, in the, in the community rather. But it's with all these things, it depends what you're trying to do. If you're trying to pursue tricky issues, then you may need to rely on external money. If you're trying to build a community of trust um, and, and bring people along together, it's a slower process, um, but local money and local support are key. Thank you for that. Well, we're getting um, some questions coming in from the audience, too, so I want to pull some of those in. I'm going to continue on the same theme about you know, how do the community foundations or the institutions really support this. Um, Marie Ross asks if, you know, version for you around what kind of strategies TPF has used. Have you focused on the small donors or the major donors or the corporations, the various groups Jenny just talked about? Um, and then also a quick question for you both around the legal structures and do you have a 501c3? Um, how do you manage the, the transfer funds? And Luke asks how you also meet the scrutiny requirements for international transactions that happen. So maybe I'll turn um, that first to you briefly first and then Jenny if you have anything to add as well. Certainly. And I'll try to be brief so that we don't run out of time, but they are such important questions, and I'd like to thank the audience for bringing uh, these important issues up. Um, I'll, I'll first start by saying that as the um, um, TPF is the um, organization that is uh, 501c3, and uh, we are um, completely um, uh, within the, uh, we work within the um, requirements um, that we have in uh, um, with uh, the IRS um, brings to us. I'm sorry, just now I lost the um, the, um, uh, the video. It's um, so uh, 501c3 is the um, uh, makes sure that uh, we are IRS. Um, uh, we imply we go with everything that IRS requires of us, and that means that when we are uh, giving grants, 
we have to um, not only do, do in immense due diligence on these um, um, local Turkish NGOs, um, but we also have to uh, keep every piece of that and uh, keep it for our auditors. Um, so the IRS equivalency um, uh, requires us to get their audited reports, um, tax reports, mission statement, board budget. Um, now, in this case, especially um, when you are dealing with Turkey, I'd like to add that where TPF really brings the added value is we have a um, long-standing relationship with all these local NGOs. Um, before we... Um, Made, before we made even a grant, a one dollar grant to them many years ago, we started talking to them, um, trying to find out um, how they work and what their needs are. So our um, our uh, view was always not to be um, top down, but to work with the local um, NGOs, with the local people together um, in a team, in an in an you know, all sides being equal and try to find the solutions. Um, so in that sense, we actually know the founders and the staff of most of those institutions uh, quite well. And um, I would say that um, especially when you are um, dealing with a country where the philanthropy has been a lot, uh, a lot newer in the American sense, let's say in terms of being institutions, you have to be very careful uh, who are the people that are involved. Intention um, is, we all have very good intentions, but implementation is really um, what uh, makes a project be uh, wildly successful versus a project that just, um, you know, works out okay or, um, or a project that does, is not received uh, uh, very well. Um, and I would uh, say that um, uh, what the other thing that um, um, TPF really does is that we're trying to um, also um, at, try to get these uh, in local NGOs from meeting today's needs to think about tomorrow and address the root causes today um, and to do this um, in their own way. Um, we want this to be done in the Turkish way. We want them to find the solutions. Uh, we want them, we are there to enable them really to do their work um, the best that they can. It's uh, um, and, uh, you know, in terms of um, the, um, uh, you know, at the end of it, you really can do the, the kind of um, work that a community foundation like, like TPF does, like a diaspora community foundation that like TPF does, by keeping the um, channels, communication channels open and honest. And, um, and that, is, um, that really makes sure that um, the, the kind of effort and time that is put in today um, really does pay off in multiple ways in the future. Um, did this, um, you know, I don't want to take up too much time again, did this at least touch upon uh, the questions that the audience has? Jason, remind me if there is a point that I missed. That was great, Virginia, thank you. Um, and Jenny, I don't know if you want to comment. Uh, it gets a little bit more technical, but in the work that you've done with you know, community foundations around the globe, around the banking securities and financial transaction securities, because that is a question that does come up, is how do you, how do the institutions ensure that they're you know, moving the money in a responsible manner? Um, well, I, I, we, we are registered as a UK organization and a South African organization, and so we do the due diligence on our local partners. I think it all, you know, without kind of getting too technical on it and speaking more from the kind of the practicalities of it, if you are trying to build philanthropy locally, you will do anything, everything in your power to reduce your risks. You will not make grants that will risk your reputation because if you are a grant-making foundation, that's really all you have. And it is a very powerful tool for demonstrating transparency and accountability. But I think it builds in a kind of... Um, anti-risk factor uh, because you don't have other tools at your disposal to demonstrate your work. So grant making is both your, your biggest asset, but it also exposes you to risk. So I think there is naturally a, a desire to mitigate risks on that part. Thank you for that. Uh, Luke, just to say, if you'd like to email us at info at we're happy to connect you to some of the more technical resources that support organizations that want to do this type of work. It's not what Boulder Giving does, but we're happy to help connect you to resources for that. Um, 
shifting gears a little bit, so Kimberly had a question, which I thought was an interesting one, and for you, Jenny, either of you, if you want to comment on, about the relationship between remittances and philanthropy, and have you seen that those who are sending remittances, money back to their families in their country of origin, or back to their uh, villages or communities in their country of origin, how do the flow of remittances and the practice of sending a remittance relate to the idea of philanthropic contributions back to the, your country of origin? Have you seen that people do both, or different people engage in one or the other? How does the conversation evolve? Um, I could just um, you know quickly tell you from uh, uh, from my perspective. Um, in the, at the end of the day, um, many people actually do both. Um, there will be, um, uh, and again, before there was TPF where I could give to broad causes, there was um, maybe two institutions, Turkish, um, uh, uh, Turkey-based institutions that were registered as, as 501c3 in the States. Uh, so I would um, I would usually give to them, but that was really going to an educational cause, and I was not able to give broadly. So I would... Uh, um, I would just send the money to my parents, and I would just ask them uh, to uh, do the philanthropy um, uh, in our family's name. Um, now that TPF is uh, is um, is uh, uh, funded, um, it's um, it's a lot easier for people to do both. Um, uh, it depends on uh, what the needs are, and and this gets very very personal um, because everyone's situation is very different. Um, however, um, our idea is uh, to try to reach those people um, who may be thinking, oh, you know, I was just going to send, uh, you know, uh, $500 this year and um, to do some charitable work. And I really do not know if uh, any in the foundation here would accept that. Our, really, our work here is really to dispel that myth and to show everybody that uh, even a dollar um, is utilized. It's utilized in an accountable way. It's utilized uh, for projects, and it really gets to um, the, the people it's supposed to reach. Um, now, we're able to do that because um, our, um, our board members and our endowment um, takes um, about you know, almost all of our uh, costs. Um, it's, uh, it's there um, to... Um, uh, to take care of these costs. So we're able to give that assurance to um, people who may just want to give us some money using the web um, or sending us a check um, that, and we really communicate with them uh, with a, a acknowledgement letter right away. Um, and, uh, and then we also follow up with them um, saying that, you know, all this amount has gone to this, info, this uh, organization that you'd intended and it will be used in this way, and we will keep periodically following up with you. Um, but um, in the end, this, this really is related to, I think in time, a lot more people are going to find out about diaspora um, um, foundations like, uh, uh, like TPF. Other um, uh, uh, groups have their own. Um, AIF is for India, and the Brazilian Foundation is there to do the exact same thing in Brazil. It's, um, uh, but this is a very good question, and in the end, philanthropy and remittances should really not, um, uh, they should not compete. I think people, if they have a will, they really can do both. Thank you. And I think that's a great point that it often, you know, one flows to the other, that people see their philanthropy as a supplement or an add-on on top of the direct remittances that they're sending. Um, Jenny, any experience or reflection from this question of the relationship between remittances and or charitable giving? Yeah, I think there has been a danger at times to conflate remittances with philanthropy, to look at flows of money when actually it's just, it's people, it's life, it's, it's paying for bills for your family and it just happens that you're in a different country rather in the same place. And um, in the same way that there's been a sort of tendency to Sometimes, you know, it's important to acknowledge local systems of support and solidarity, but not to confuse them with what we're talking about here, you know, that when people create savings and rotating savings and credit systems, they're doing it, it's, just, it's in the absence of social safety nets and other systems, it's often the sign of a failed government. But I think the sort of sweet spot that we're talking about here is is a kind of hypothesis, is if people are prepared 
to send money. People have the habit of sending money. They have the habit of collaboration to support each other, um, to, to exist, to survive. Then what does it take when there is a surplus to start creating the types of mechanisms, whether it's a community foundation or the Turkish Philanthropic Fund, you know, to actually think creatively about how you tap into that trust, that social capital, that culture, and modernize these types of giving uh, as, a, as an extra, which can really go back and deal with root causes. Um, but but I think it's important not to confuse the two uh, because I'm sure a you know a Nepali worker working on the football stadium in Qatar at the moment sending money home to his family that's remittances and his hard work rather than philanthropy. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and since we are coming up on the end of the hour, I just want to I'll, I'll ask Jenny and Virgil both for. Uh, to share some final comments of what you would like to leave the audience with in a moment. But just want to thank all of you for joining us for this hour and also to let you know we have uh, quite a number of webinars coming up and webcasts and conversations in the next couple months. So on April 23rd, at, and all of these are at um, Eastern time, so at noon, we're going to have a conversation with Helen Hunt Hendricks and Leah Hunt Hendricks, mother-daughter pair, talking about Giving as a Family. Helen's the founder of Women Moving Millions. Leah's the founder of the Solidaire Donor Network. They are deeply involved in their family philanthropy together and independently. Um, on April 30th, we're going to be hosting a session with the Indie Philanthropy Project, which is put together an amazing new collection of stories about different donors and foundations and giving vehicles that are trying to shake up the process of how we do giving. Um, so it's uh, on April 30th at 1 p.m. On May 7th will be our next um, Global Givers webinar with the WINGS organization's co-sponsor again. Um, May 7th at 11 a.m. Eastern, we're going to be showcasing our new donor storytelling toolkit. So one of the things we've been working with groups around the world on is sharing the experience from Boulder Giving that we have spent the last seven years of how do you collect and share stories of inspiring givers like Virju. Uh, so putting together a toolkit to support uh, NGOs and civil society groups that are trying to inspire others to give. Uh, on May 21st will be have, is Give Out Day, which is the National Day of Giving for LGBT Issues in the United States. We'll be doing a noon um, webcast talking about the landscape of LGBT philanthropy. And then finally on June 25th at noon we'll be talking about impact investing and bringing an environmental lens to your investments. So kind of a wide range, you'll find information about all of those on our website. Um, but for now, I want to ask Virju uh, and then Jenny if you have any final comment or something you want to make sure people leave today thinking about when they think about diaspora donors. Well, I'd like to just stress that philanthropy is really a habit at the end of the day. It's something that um, once you start um, and, and, and you just get some personal um, results for yourself. Um, uh, it's, uh, it, it really makes a difference not only um, to the world or to the community or uh, to your neighbor um, uh, living right next to you, but it makes a big difference to the um, person uh, himself and herself. And I like to just, uh, you know, uh, would like to just ask all the donors to, at the end of the day, to think about um, what they themselves have gained um, from all the work that they do um, and, and keep um, those thoughts uh, as they continue their work. And, and this, I think, is very important because without reflecting back, um, uh, it's, it's hard to keep educating oneself and, and keep uh, working, volunteering your time, uh, your effort, uh, getting your connections in. And, and giving financially. Um, but, um, but at the end of the day, uh, we're all one big social project. And uh, philanthropy is really a way of um, us connecting with one another person to person in a meaningful way and, and enriching um, you know, our, our, our whole communities and also, in a way, enriching our inner selves. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone um, for inviting me here today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure uh, to hear everything that you've said and Jenny said. And I myself have learned um, very much. So it's been incredibly beneficial to me. And I'd like to thank the audience for their questions. Thank you. Jenny, over to you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Bursu. Um, 
I think uh, we we all value and appreciate it when things work, when there's when there are institutions and there's infrastructure. And I think that the diaspora communities, particularly when they're, their home community is somewhere which has weak institutions and weak infrastructure, are a, a perfect group, a, a perfect asset to really kind of understand the value of a kind of philanthropy that is about sustainability. It's about strong institutions that it can live, exist over a long period of time, not just one-off gifts that get you your tax break and a you know a, a nice email acknowledgement. So I think. I think the opportunity to really mobilize this group of, of donors who and get them excited about being able to kind of create the, the types of institutions that exist in more Western developed contexts that can reach different parts of the community in different ways. And having those exist in their own hometowns is, is really very sort of exciting and, and, and powerful and that one shouldn't be afraid of of, of the cost of doing that, but it's actually a huge investment in the end. Um, so I, I, I look forward to kind of continuing this conversation because, as I said right at the beginning, I think this is a hugely important area, but there's an opportunity to do much more really kind of thoughtful work and connecting around it. And so, Borsu, I'll be in touch with you after this. But uh, thank you, Jason and Otta, for, for having me on this call as well today. Thank you, Jenny. I look forward thank to you. keeping in touch. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you, Roger and Jenny, for a wonderful conversation and to everyone who joined us today. And I just want to remind you that if you want to learn more about Boulder Giving's Global Stories Initiative, you can visit the website at globalgivers.org, and hopefully you'll find some of the stories, donor stories that we have from around the world really inspiring. And you can read Bourgeois' story on the website as well. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.